Um, so, uh, yes, I know that patents is only a subset, uh, or patentable innovations are only a subset of all innovations out there. Uh, but there's a good reason as to why, you know, I think. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, there's a good reason as to why uh, I think uh, patents are important. Uh, I'm going to try and give you an overview of what I understand or we understand as uh, the patent laws in India and China. I'm going to summarize some of the papers uh, mostly with regard to India. Some of them are cross-country as well. Um, and I'm going to so, sort of divide it into two aspects. This is once again sort of predicting or extrapolating uh, based on what uh, Eva might need. Uh, I've sort of divided it into implications for multinational firms versus domestic firms, broadly speaking. And then, you know, these are not cast in stone, so we can tinker around them. Um, and some sort of overall messages, and then questions about how, you know, we can address some of uh, uh, the questions that Eva is trying to answer vis-a-vis -vis their clients a little bit better. Um, so, yes, patents, uh, for the most part, uh, you know, patentable innovations is only a subset, but arguably there's a lot of work that suggests that patent is a very important form of uh, protecting intellectual property. Perhaps the strongest form, uh, firms uh, end up spending a lot, uh, just not on patenting, but like sort of defending their patents as well. Um, and patents, uh, you know, the rationale behind patenting is that it enables in, in innovators to protect their innovations for a period of time. Uh, so for, so the India and China are essentially countries that are, you know, sort of at the moment trying to catch up with uh, maybe the technologically advanced West. So in some sense, uh, you know, th these, uh, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, uh, are also, patents are also avenues to get foreign firms to invest in their respective countries, India and China, so much so that the domestic firms can actually learn from them uh, and uh, maybe upgrade themselves or even leapfrog the, uh, the Western firms. Uh, Right, so there are of course other ways of doing that, right? We know the uh, Tata Rover deal. Yes, they, they did it. Uh, and one of the big uh, push uh, for uh, the acquisition, I believe, and this is from the popular press at Wharton as well, um, is the fact that they were just trying to learn from Rover, right? Tata was desperate to enter the high-end automotive segment. Um, of course, there were, uh, 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 they were experts uh, within India, but they really wanted to get a flavor of this automob automotive segment outside, the high-end automotive segment, and they figured out that they had a lot to learn from Rover, and, you know, at, at least some of the um, experts suggest that this was a big uh, driver in terms of acquiring uh, Rover as well. But the flip side is, you know, it costed them $2.3 billion, and maybe if there was better flow of technology from the West to for want of a better word, the East, maybe, you know, a firm like Tata need not shell out 2.3 million, 2.3 billion dollars, right? So clearly, you know, maybe there are patents have this kind of implication in so far as domestic firms are concerned as well. So I'm, I'm going to talk, of, talk about it. So the idea over here is that if patents are weak, multinationals, uh, don't want to invest in uh, countries, FDI, uh, either in terms of setting up their, even operating in those countries or even setting up R&D units in a particular country, they're not very keen on doing it simply because they're worried that they might lose their uh, intellectual property. Yeah, yeah. So, and, but the point is that there are also inevitably some spillovers for domestic firms. And the issue is that, uh, you know, somehow patents sort of mediate that, that sort of process. Right, and uh, in the absence of that, you know, a firm like Tata would have to really go out and acquire firms. So maybe patents for domestic firms is an easy way of doing it, and this is precisely what the multinational firms are also concerned about, right? So I'm just laying out the fact that it's a double-edged sword at this moment, right? Uh, on one hand, you know, countries need patents if they need foreign technology. Domestic firms also want it, but you know, uh, and if the domestic firms did not have it, they actually have to go out and do other sort of activities to acquire the same amount of knowledge. That's all I'm saying at this point. So the alternative for Tata would have been to develop the technology 
well if if so the the argument sort of the implicit argument that i'm trying to make is if there was flow of technology rover was somehow operating in india maybe tatas could have found other ways to acquire the same learning right uh, and the fact and that would have been sort of possible if india had a strong patent regime right so this is sort of what i'm i'm trying to say over here right and and of course right i mean this is based on the idea that this is the only reason why tata went out and acquired rover and i'm by no means stretch of imagination i'm saying that but i'm just trying to highlight the fact that there are other ways of doing it plausibly more expensive ways of doing it I'm certainly going to talk about India. Uh, I don't have that kind of knowledge about China. Nabahar can probably add. Um, India, there's always uh, the, uh, the, the, there's a difference between the de facto and the de jure IPR itself, right? There's something that's on paper, but there's also something that works in the courts. So I'm actually going to talk about some of those issues as well. So the, you know, there's been a lot of murmurs about how India and China have gone about implementing these patent laws themselves. Um, and these, uh, despite the fact that, you know, on paper, these laws seem to be comparable to some of these laws in the UK, for example, there are lots of stories that you see, for example, in New York Times or Wall Street Journal that suggest that the protection is not bulletproof. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about some of those issues as well. Um, so this is uh, to Albert's question, right? Um, so there is this... Uh, literature as well as uh, uh, popular press which suggests that patents um, enable technology transfer uh, that was not available for the domestic firms. Um, but you know, of late, uh, this need not be true, right? Some of the domestic firms themselves argue that this may not be true. And I'm going to give you an example again. So there was a medicine called Tarsiva, uh, which is an anti-cancer drug uh, that Roche introduced in India. And this was uh, patented in the US and elsewhere. Um, but uh, there was an Indian company, Cipla, a very large Indian pharmaceutical company, that launched uh, uh, a copied or an imitated version. Uh, you know, this was only launched, the original drug was only launched in January, but you know, the copycat drug was launched in December. So you know, very, very shortly thereafter. So that's the point. Um, and uh, you know, for people, who, you know, all, we understand that, you know, manufacturing plants and so on and so forth cannot be set up in a jiffy, right? So, so this is some evidence the, about the fact that, you know, uh, there are two ways to look at the same issue. Uh, the set of domestic firms believe that, you know, um, if we can learn this technology anyway, patents is like a, imposing a tax, right? Because now, in this example, Roche is going to come to India and then maybe uh, CIPLA would have to pay a license fee, right? Um, on the other hand, if patent laws weren't there, a firm like uh, CIPLA uh, could basically manufacture the imitated drug without paying any money, license fee over here, right? So there are two sides to the coin, right? So even in the government circles in India, there are two sides to this uh, patent debate. There are many sides to this debate, but the two sides that I'm trying to highlight over here is one is this angle of uh, technology transfer, the Tata example, right? We would, may not be able to learn unless there is somebody who's actually working in the same country uh, and tells us, uh, or there's some sort of tacit knowledge that we can learn about operating the high-end car segment in a different country, right? There's one view, uh, that's one view. The second view is that, look, we can learn from this technology anywhere, right? In this uh, day and age uh, of uh, Google searches and whatever else, Right? We can uh, learn about this technology anyway. And if you're going to give these guys, like Roche patents in India, this is like imposing a tax on us, something that we could have done by ourselves anyway, but now we are actually making, making us pay for it. Right? There are these two sides uh, to the do uh, debate. Um, and you know, part of what I'm going to talk about sort of addresses both, maybe both, the, both of these sides of the debate a little bit. Yeah. Um, Um, it's in the courts. Uh, it's still been determined by the court. The lower court said Roche uh, does not have the right to a patent. The case is still pending, pending in the Supreme Court. Yeah. 
Yeah, so patent rights are territorial in nature. Yeah, it's geograph you know, geographically bounded. Yeah, um, and you know, and in the Indian Patent Office, there's been a lot of unpredictability in terms of which patents they would grant versus not. They've denied patents that were granted in many countries, right? So this was the debate about Novartis, for example. The patent that was denied in India was actually granted worldwide. Um, but the Indian Patent Office just said, you know, we are going to deny it. Um, so there's a lot of unpredictability about whether uh, the, uh, the Indian Patent Office would grant somebody a patent or not. Um, there is a specific section. I'm happy to talk about it. It's coming in the next slide, next maybe a couple of slides, I think. But uh, uh, for multinationals too, right? There's been a lot of debate. Uh, for example, th there's a Wall Street Journal article that talks about most managers, multinational managers, obsess about intellectual property issues before uh, deciding whether they should enter India or China, especially. Uh, there was an Economist article as well which said that most of them are, in fact, investing in India and China. So there was some uh, ridiculous number, something like 90% of all new R&D plants started, so which I don't believe for a, for a moment, but that's what the numbers said, despite the big concerns of IP protection. Um, right? uh, and for a, from a M M multinational perspective, at least two things. Right? One is about entry strategies. Right? Should I enter or not? If I don't enter, like uh, Jay said, I'm giving up on opportunities as a multinational for growth. Um, if I do enter, what, what does happen to my long-term competitive advantage? Is IP, intellectual property, that's very valuable to me, is it going to leak, leak out to some of my domestic competitors who are today domestic competitors might, might become global competitors later on? Right? This is the obvious uh, concern. Uh, the second aspect, of course, is... Uh, you know, have all of all these companies want to continue to do R&D, but they're also searching for cheaper avenues to do that. Um, some of them are actually also looking for, um, uh, you know, new ideas, right? So you would have, uh, um, for example, GE, who is trying to do, come up with new ideas uh, itself using India as their R&D &D, uh, destination. Um, but you also have uh, people, companies like Texas Instruments, um, who are actually trying to use India as uh, sort of to reduce their cost of doing R&D itself, right? Um, so it does have, you know, implications, and there's, there's work uh, that I've done and others have done as well, which suggests that the, uh, the strength of patents critically determine that. Right, whether or whether a firm is going to source ideas or not, and in, in our case, I'll also talk a little bit about the nature of ideas that are sourced from these places. Um, so, what is the extent of the R&D supply chain, uh, and what kind of ideas get sourced from where? Right. So, it seems like uh, the strength of patents might have a, a significant effect on that as well. And we have, um, you know, again. Uh, an economist report that talks about that a little bit too. So um, I'm going to build on that as well. Um, so uh, one reason, uh, you know, the, this debate, right? I mean, there is this need for multinationals to source uh, sort of source ideas from elsewhere. Um, there is, uh, it also influences the extent of the R&D supply chain. That's for the multinationals. On the domestic firm side, again, it's a two-sided coin. Some of them say, yes, we need flow of foreign technology. Others say that, look, patents is like imposing a tax on us, on ideas that were otherwise available to us for free. Right? What, uh, what is the truth? So often, the, there are these economic uh, nationalistic arguments in countries, especially India, that I'm familiar with. And their politicians often couch it as, look, you know, this is an issue, you know, we don't need patents because it's going to increase prices. It's going to defeat access of essential commodities to the poor. And I'm talking about medicines, right? This argument has been made in the context of pharmaceuticals and agriculture, agricultural chemicals as well. And they say that, look, we don't need patents simply because the poor people are not going to be access, uh, going to be able to access these essential commodities. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well. So, so, to take that argument then to the next step, is the government then suggesting that Indian companies 
should actually invest the money to develop the factories locally and to do it cheaper? Or are they saying we should just steal the West technology and, um, and, not, and not make our people pay for it, right? Because one is nationalistic and the other is communist. Yeah, uh, the, so a short answer, and I'll give you a long answer a little bit later. The short answer is they feel that the latter is, they're suggesting the latter. They don't say that, but they suggest that. And there's a little bit of path dependence to that as well. And I'll talk about how these patent laws evolved both in India and China as well. And there's a little bit of history that uh, shapes this as well. There is this thinking in general that ideas need to be free, right? Uh, and it's a little bit like the open source argument, right? Ideas need to be free, but how are you going to incentivize people to produce ideas? So this is for the fundamental debate. And these countries, you know, again, in a, in a world wherein there was only one country, people all people understand that look, it's not you know people would not be producing ideas if there were no patents. But then when there are multiple countries involved, the question is why should we be producing the ideas? Why can we, why can't we just uh, steal from the others, right? Uh, you know there are these other countries. Yeah. So you know, and this is in some sense uh, a very perverse uh, division of labor if you think about uh, it in the following sense, right? In the sense that let them produce all the ideas and maybe we specialize in something else, right? Um, and... Uh, and produce all the ideas and we'll just buy them out, which is what they're increasingly doing now. We won't just steal them, we'll just buy the, old, the yeah. entire company, the all those facades, the kukas. And but that, that's at least the difference, because at least yes, somewhere in the system there's an economic return for the original investment, right. as opposed to just stealing it, mm -hmm. is basically... There's I mean, I, you know, especially if you think about SIPLA, right, if you just uh, go to the YouTube and then, uh, you know, look at some of the interviews of uh, the uh, Hamid, the current CEO of uh, SIPLA, you would see these views coming uh, through very strongly. Um, he would say that, look, there are people suffering, they will, you know, the first uh, maybe few minutes of this video will give you a paint of very gory pictures, show somebody suffering and so on and so forth, and there'll be a bunch of interviews of people saying that, look, this person did not have access to this drug which costs X amount of rupees per day. And then they'll say, okay, this is what CIPLA is trying to do, right? But so, presumably yeah, they so, but, but, that's, but that's, that's the message that is buried underneath, right? I mean, so there is this, uh, and these guys do a very good. The benevolence to society, sure. it's that we want to make the money instead of someone else making the money. Correct. Okay. That's true. Yeah, so, and. But that, I mean, in some ways that's, I mean, that's that's a very that's the most common business strategy in the world. Well, it's right? Right? Yeah, because I think in any sector, the foreign firms there, they know that the domestic producers are going to be catching up, and they're going to be figuring all sorts of ways to imitate and copy their technology. I mean, some of that's not even illegal. It's like if I buy the product and I study it and I figure out how to do it. From, I mean, there's nothing illegal about that in the sense of it's not especially if it's not patented. And so. There's this question about when is that when when that's actually patented information, then it is stealing. But it's 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 just the normal way that business works in many sectors. The foreign firms even know this is going to happen, so they just say that's fine. We plan to we plan to have our next model in the next three years, and we just have to stay ahead. And we'll always have we'll always have the corner on the high quality market. But they understand that it's really a fight over this middle price, middle quality. True, right? I mean, and some of these findings are basically going to lay this out, right? I mean, in the sense that there is, uh, there is truth everywhere, there, is, uh, there are lies everywhere as well. So, um, and that's sort of what uh, I think, you know, at least some of these uh, topics are going to uh, bring to the fore, right? Uh, there's a difference among uh, patterns of different industries. So you'll find that this sort of argument runs more strongly for, for uh, medicines or agricultural products where it wouldn't be so strong for automobiles or ICT or so forth. So this is a pro poor sort of innovation. We need this for the very basic sustenance of our society to, to keep ourselves healthy and alive. And, you, mean and our you mean the policy debates are different? Yes, right. And, 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 and this also varies depending on which country has competence in which types of industries, right? I mean, India is making this argument presumably because it thinks Pharmacy, the pharmaceutical industry is one of its powerhouses, right? right. I mean, 
uh, and you would probably see a different argument, right? And ironically, right, I mean, there's not been much uh, written about software, for example, uh, in India. And if you just skim through some of the patenting, you know, you would see you would see, see that some of these large Indian software players are not even patenting. Their business models are completely different, right? Which is the reason why, you know, it's, I think it's convenient for some of the politicians to, to take this route, right? Um, Okay, so I'm, now I'm going to sort of now, maybe I've motivated this debate a little bit, and then now I'm going to give you a little bit of background. Uh, feel free to jump in. Um, uh, here is my understanding of uh, Chinese IPR laws. Uh, you know, the first uh, substantive patent law was enacted in 1912. Um, and look at, you know, I just want to highlight the path dependence here as well, right? And in 1912, uh, the law of, uh, offered uh, patent protection only for Chinese nationals. Right, I mean, this is the way the law was written too. Um, in 1923, it was uh, extended to American nationals as well. Uh, but, you know, claims of poor em enforcement, even in those days, was actually rampant, right? So, you know, there are articles, uh, historical articles, which suggest that, look, you know, this is only on paper, but American nationals actually don't get uh, any kind of patent protection. Even uh, in 1924, uh, the law was once again uh, amended to 1932 and said that, okay, you guys are complaining, you know, we will take away the right from you, right? Uh, so we will go back to only granting patents to Chinese nationals. Um, and after the, uh, you know, the set of political changes that happened uh, in between in 1963, the belief was that all ideas uh, have to be accessible to the public. Uh, and the IP rights were completely abolished. Any ideas was uh, supposed to be accessible to everybody. Um, and all IP, you know, if it was generated uh, within China, belonged to the government. And in around the 1980s, there was this need for better integration globally, I think. Uh, and some of uh, Albert and Nabahar may, may be able to comment more on sort of what those scenarios were. Um, and hence, in 1984, China started to think that, well, we, maybe if we want to integrate ourselves better to the uh, global economy, we need some sort of a patent law. After all, this is what the West has been complaining about. So let's enact, enact a patent law that contained uh, basic provisions, such as what the uh, patent can cover, the subject matter of patents, some basic process elements. Um, and, uh, and this is the important point, right? Uh, and I want to highlight this. this. You will see similarities with India as well. Uh, the 1984 law excluded uh, patents for food, beverages, and pharmaceuticals. You will see sort of this uh, logic uh, in India as well, right? And once again, it goes back to this idea that, you know, ideas need to be free. You know, why should we be producing all the ideas? Um, and in 1992, you know, given this need to sort of integrate into the global economy, I think China was also looking to enter the World Trade Organization. And in order to enter the World Trade Organization, one of the preconditions was that, look, why don't you get your patent laws uh, in better shape? Uh, in 1990, especially pharmaceuticals, right? I mean, the large pharmaceutical, so there are lots, there's lots written in the popular press that talks about how the uh, Western uh, multinational pharmaceutical companies actually lobbied uh, to the WTO, um, getting India and China to cover pharmaceuticals um, as a part of their uh, patent reform. Um, in 1992, uh, they, you know, the law covered pharmaceutical compositions. Uh, compositions is the chemical form, the chemical substance underlying the drug. Um, so, and in 2000, China implemented uh, Something that uh, the World Trade Organization looked at and said it's okay. And you know, your patent laws now seem like they are in line with what we want. Right? This is sort of the evolution of the law. And you would see that there are parallels in India as well. So in uh, India, patent rights or intellectual property per se itself has been very, very controversial precisely because of these issues. Right? The, uh, there is the story often that the politicians make, uh, which is that, look, you know, patents means that you're denying access to the people who need uh, essential commodities. Uh, until, the 19, until 1972, India continued with the British uh, patent law, which is very pro-innovation. 14 years, uh, 
patent rights modeled uh, after the UK law, completely modeled after the UK law, protection up to 14 years. Uh, included patents to everything, including agriculture, pharmaceuticals, and chemicals. Um, in 1972, that happened, right? The uh, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi in 1972 looked at the pharmaceutical industry and the agriculture chemical industry and said that, look, most of these are foreign firms. They are uh, making us pay a, a large price, making Indians pay a large price. So why don't we change the patent law? And this happened in 1972. Product patents in pharmaceutical and agriculture chemicals were completely outlawed, right? Uh, and even um, the existing patents, their term was reduced between five and seven years, right? A completely watered on uh, patent law. So the motivation was still very, very similar, right? So there was this general belief that, you know, uh, there was an economic nationalistic type argument, right? Let people produce ideas elsewhere. We are happy to take them and build some in indigenous capacity, right? Uh, once again, this is uh, around the 1990s. India felt uh, was liberalizing, 1991, the liberalization was happening. And once again, India said, look, we need to integrate better with the global economy. Um, and they started to participate in some of the discussions of the, of the WTO. And the WTO said, well, if you want to talk to us and integrate to the global economy better, why didn't you implement? patents, especially in pharmaceuticals uh, and chemicals. And India, like China, implemented a version with safeguards, um, which uh, pa passed uh, the thresholds of the WTO. And uh, there, there are, the safeguards are uh, compulsory licensing. So when can the government take over patents from somebody, right? So the, some legal commentators suggest that the provisions, the conditions under which the government can completely take over patents, have not been very well defined. Um, and there is a specific clause, which is uh, 3D, which applies only for pharmaceuticals, which say that, look, derivatives of existing salt forms cannot be patented in India. But what is a derivative? Uh, and how do you, so unless, of course, you, pro I mean, the, the section says that derivatives cannot be patented unless the, uh, the person who's asking for a patent proves higher efficacy, right? And the law doesn't define what efficacy is. The big bone of condition, uh, contention between the pharmaceutical com uh, companies and the patent office in India is, what is efficacy? Is better solubility efficacy? The, uh, doing something such that the human body uh, absorbs the medicine better, is that better efficacy? Or do you need to fundamentally change uh, the properties of a composition to, in order to make it cure the disease better, right? Uh, so this is where most of the battles, including that of Roche, is being fought at the moment. Um, and of course, you know, this, the story that I will lay out is that these sort of provisions also give a lot of fodder for the judges to sort of make these uh, nationalistic arguments or implement these, some of these nationalistic beliefs, not arguments, but beliefs. And that is, in part, is what created the big controversy. Glyvec, the Novartis patent being uh, denied, or even Roche, the patent that I spoke about, they were denied based on this section. And, but you will see uh, that in the judgment, the judge will also talk about the cost of the drug. Right? So Glyvec would say, OK, you know, this drug costs 10 times the cost of the other copied drugs. Right? Why should we let them um, do it? And in case of Roche, it was just not that. Uh, the judge went in and said, well, you know what? This drug is not even manufactured in India. So why should we uh, grant the patent, given the, uh, that Roche? Uh, so there's some view that somehow the multinationals are going to enter India and you know, suck the blood of uh, an average Indian, right? Uh, I said an average Indian, and you know, not everybody. Um, so uh, we, we will see to what extent that's true. But you, from this background, you see that there are some common threads, right? The, the idea, you know, both of them, both of these countries in some sense believe that, look, why should we be generating all the ideas? If you go and talk to the, so I had a conversation with somebody in the Planning Commission of India a few years back, and this is the belief that he articulated, right? I mean, it's not obvious to him that India needs stronger patent laws to actually enable their companies to innovate. And he believed that the way to way for India to progress is to continue to sort of imitate. 
Uh, and there was also this overarching belief that Indian firms might be just very good at innovating in business models and not sort of these upstream ideas. Right? So his point is that, look, why do we need patent laws? It's just a waste of time. And what about all the litigation costs? Right? Um, but this is, in some sense, uh, maybe and Nabahar and Albert can talk about it as well. I think also the guiding force behind some of the, uh, I mean, the way by which Chinese patent laws have evolved as well. There's this belief that, look, ideas either need to be free or they need to be produced elsewhere. Yeah. So do you think that if the government decided to set up a national institute of pharmaceutical studies as a non-profit business, to copy pharmaceuticals globally and sell them for the lowest price, Dr. Reddy would find that as a good uh, idea? Um, they would have problems with that, yeah. right? right? Um, it's, it's, it's an interesting argument. The, 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 <coughs> the terrible multinationals are, are making money off of the Indian population, but the Indian companies can't. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit. I'm going to make the case uh, of what I found. I found that the Indians like to drive Mercedes Benzes. In other words, uh, yes, these, pri these drug prices are very expensive, but Indians also like consuming them. And this is partly because of uh, the private hospital revolution that's happening in India. Right? There's a lot of uh, power in the hands of the physicians. And the physicians don't uh, always, a lot of them, right? I've done interviews uh, with about 100 physicians or so across the country. A lot of them would tell you that I, you know, you give them comparable drugs, there's Cipla and there's Novartis. I said, which one would you prescribe? They said, Novartis. And you would ask them why. Uh, one of the answers would be, I don't want to take a risk. There are you know, a lot more trials with these drugs and so on. That is the stated reason. But you know, there are a lot of articles in Science and all these other places which suggest that it's also because of the goodies that the uh, multinationals are better able to, I mean, are, have a better ability to Give to the uh, physicians. That's largely an unregulated market. And there are huge investments at the moment that are made on the marketing front, especially by companies like Novartis, right? And because of which, uh, you know, these guys are just, I mean, some of them suggest, right, at least the, uh, the welfare organizations, they suggest that, oh, you know what, the physicians are just writing these uh, medicines, even though they are comparable. In fact, the government has stepped in, like you said, in Rajasthan and Tamil Nadu. Uh, they themselves make medicines. These are known as unbranded genetics, right? But there are any, hardly any consumers for it, right? Uh, and this would cover roughly about 1% of the market. And uh, in fact, the government of Rajasthan is thinking about shutting them down. Yeah, my impression was that the real uh, binding enforcement and this kind of intellectual property and piracy only comes when domestic firms demand it, right? Because there's, there's firms domestically who develop an innovation ability where they want to protect their own products from being copied by other cheaper domestic. And it seems like rather than talking to government officials about what they care about, you know, what do they think, why it seems more relevant to be talking to the leading firms to see what their, what their view is. And I mean, I don't know what the pharmaceuticals industry in India is like. Is it that they're all just copying? Yeah. Or are there some real innovators? Um, there are a few, but you could... Those are the ones that are going to be the leaders to try to get the government to change how they... We, we did that as well. I mean, um, arguably, I didn't talk to 100, but about 20 of them. Um, there are very few innovators, right? Biocon would be one of those. Glenmark uh, would be one of those. Uh, Redis would be one of those. But what happened with uh, Redis is also very interesting, right? So they got, uh, they went after innovation. They got one drug uh, into phase two clinical trials in the United States, but something went wrong. Uh, and overnight, right? So there is a little bit of family feud uh, lurking in the background as well. So I will abstract from that. Uh, overnight, they shut down all their R&D. They said, we'll only focus on copying. Right, and um, Citibank and ICICI Ventures, two companies that were actually funding them for the R&D, they also pulled back, right? So that is, uh, so what I'm trying to say is that th there is now this belief that Indian firms, it's just too difficult for Indian firms to innovate, 
uh, especially with, with regard to pharmaceuticals, simply because uh, a single US is the largest market. To get a drug into the United States, you need to incur a billion dollar plus to get into the US. You know, this is without the marketing tie-ups and whatever else that you need to sell the drug in the United States. Uh, if you think about a company like uh, Biocon, which is the largest uh, uh, biotech company in India, it's about $800 million. So you're asking an 800, a company that's worth $800 million to essentially spend a billion to get to the United States. And a lot of them try to get into these uh, intermediate arrangements, licensing agree agreements, right? I can you know, maybe sell my R&D to Pfizer, but you know, people like Pfizer are coming and saying that where is the benefit you know, of doing that? Because we can as well set up our units in Bangalore or elsewhere, even if there is expertise, but this is an area wherein you don't even have expertise at the moment. Right? So these R&D deals are not happening, uh, and these companies to enter the United States have to spend a billion dollar plus. And these companies are now saying that, look, there's just no point. And if you just look at the, uh, so the one manager at uh, Redis Labs uh, told us that, look, are you out of your mind? Why do you want us to do R&D? You know, these uh, innovation-based drugs gives you a return on assets of four to five percent. And look, we are making 20 percent return on assets so, by just copying. We, we, we've taken you deep into a discussion about the Indian patent law, which probably wasn't your intention. But um, the question then becomes, I think, I assume your premise is, Patents are an indicator of innovation. And we've just spent quite a bit of time now talking about why the patent process in India might not necessarily correlate to innovation and actually might correlate to non-innovation. So is that still a good indicator for innovation when you look at patent law applications, patent law assumptions? So there's, there's still country specificity in the, these arguments, right? Um, so it depends on the nature of innovation. So if you think about a company, a country like the United States, right, uh, is patenting a reasonable indi indicator of uh, innovations in that country? The answer might be, yeah, to, to some extent. If you ask the same question in India, perhaps not, right? I'll show you some numbers in a little bit. Uh, and so some of these arguments also come from the fact that, you know, lots of these Indian firms believe that it's, technology is not what they are good at. Right? I mean, there's this, uh, like Airtel, for example. The overarching belief is it's not about technology. It's about how you, you know, other uh, things which uh, is popularly couched as business models. Right? Um, and, and maybe that, that's where they feel that they have a relative uh, comparative advantage. Um, and these arguments, uh, but on the other hand, they, they also want this fundamental technology so that they can then apply their business models and take it out to the market. Right, so even, you know, they are undecided and you, these answers would vary by sectors. Okay. So here are some numbers. Uh, this is a co comparison between patenting in India versus China. So you would see, um, you know, most of the figures for India, you know, not even visible, right? Uh, and of course, China has made incredible progress, right? So this is partly uh, one of the motivating parts of uh, the report that we wanted to write. Here are two countries that appear to have had a similar background, but you know, the blue indicates China. Uh, China is rapidly catching up, and in fact, there are some articles that eventually it will outpace the, uh, the United States in terms of number of patent applications, right? And I'm not talking about quality here again, patent quality, there's lots written about the, the quality of the patents as well. Um, but just the fact that, you know, here is the U.S., here is China, it seems like they, they might be catching up, right? Uh, again, these figures are a little bit dated. And India is hardly visible there, right? And what I'm going to show you, and, and the uh, picture right on top, this one, uh, is not mine. It's borrowed from Kenneth Swang's uh, work on China, which shows that most of the uh, ramping up of patents is by the uh, private uh, enterprises in China, right? It's not, uh, as suspected, not uh, government or university. There's some of that as well. But if you just stare at the uh, brown line, it's the private enterprises. Just a question. In China figure, should there be a comma somewhere? I mean, uh, it looks like it's uh, four times bigger than USA. Is it, is it the case or there is a comma missing? It's uh, it's hundred and yeah you're right it's hundred and eighty six point one yeah good good pick yeah thanks um, 
yeah, so that's what it is, but you know, rapidly catching up. That's the uh, point, but you know, despite these similarities, there are these big uh, differences in outcomes, and partly this could reflect the fact that these countries, you know, their ecosystems are different, or you know, the companies believe that they should not be uh, doing the technological innovation. Could be that as well, right? Um, and if you look at who patents in India, uh, most of the patents are by foreign firms, right? The blue line or the blue area is uh, by uh, foreign firms. Uh, and uh, this is increasing, right? So the percentage of foreign owned patents is about 88%. Marginally, it's gone up from the uh, prior period, but it's about a staggering 90%. Uh, Close to 90% of all patents in India are held by foreign firms. There's hardly, there's a little bit of an uptake, but not a whole lot. The interesting to know about this premise is true, which is the patent by Indian groups is done when the India company has a inherent domestic advantage. Yeah, but uh, otherwise, if they don't, why bother? Whereas the foreign ones, you would understand why they would attempt to protect themselves, even though it sounds like they're unsuccessful. So this actually gives us an input. Maybe that's uh, something that we could go back and ask these Indian firms. But you know, from doing it as a pure data exercise, there are just few. So few of them, yeah. that it's, it's hard to, uh, you know, parse uh, these out uh, statistically, right? Um, so I, I mean, I'm, I, so this is sort of the background, right? I mean, you could think about this as uh, a background of where are the similarities, you know, where are the differences, and maybe you could think about some of these messages as, you know, what partially contributes to these differences, right? Uh, and I'm going to sort of divide uh, some of the findings based on the, one of the projects that was funded by IMS uh, as well as other work that I'm doing into two categories. So there are findings that uh, apply to both these countries. There are findings that only apply to India and Navahar can uh, add to that. So, uh, so the first question is, you know, if you take the multinationals uh, perspective, multinational firms perspective, you know, did it matter for R&D offshoring, right? So, you know, there was the story that I had spoken about that multinationals are really, really concerned about the strength of intellectual property regimes before deciding on should I source ideas from India or China and what kinds of ideas should I source on India and China? The, um, the answer is, you know, I'm going to, you know, give you a little bit of background before uh, answering that question. The background is it, uh, you, know, the, you know, we went and spoke to multinationals they generally talk about two sort of innovations um, that they do in uh, countries like India and China. One, they say that, look, we use multinational, I mean, India and China to s source innovations that we would be using in our home country, right? Uh, for example, SIP has a lab uh, which covers their entire, uh, uh, you know, the company. And Shell, for example, Shell's Bangalore R&D unit performs fundamental and applied research uh, on these areas. This is global, right? So these ideas are sort of sourced for the global markets, but it just turns out that the R&D units uh, happen to be in India, right? So that is one scenario. The second scenario is, you know, look, we really want to operate in the uh, host country itself, right? GE, for example, has made huge investments. GE Healthcare has made huge investments uh, for India-specific innovations. And some of the things that they at least talk about on their website is the uh, ECG machine, portable ECG machine, which uh, costs about one-tenth the price of a normal ECG machine. And infant, uh, infant uh, incubators, uh, once again, which costs about a tenth of the normal cost. Right? So this is sort of the second scenario. So there are these two different reasons as to why uh, multinationals perform R&D in India or China. Um, and what we found is that the influence of patents on offshoring is, uh, you know, it seems more like a media darling than anything else, right? Lots are written about it, but, you know, the, influ the real influence seems to be uh, limited, partly because, um, you know, it only matters for a few types of projects, right? It only matters for projects of this type, for which the innovations are produced for the home country, the GE type scenario. It doesn't appear to matter for the other type, right? If all the multinationals are doing is to source technology from India and China and then applying it to the US, maybe there are long-term consequences, but it doesn't seem to at least matter in the short term, 
right? Um, and the second reason is that, you know, the MNCs are also learning, right? You know, over a period of time, they understand how their employees interact with uh, employees of other firms and so on and so forth. They also appear to strategically choose projects that are less prone to leakage, right? I mean, for example, uh, you know, they do projects uh, that do not build on their prior knowledge that are very specific to them as well, for example, right? So Microsoft uh, operating system, uh, some of the components of the operating system, even if a company like uh, Infosys steals it from them, Infosys would not know what to do with it. So those kinds of projects are actually done in India. So over a period of time, these managers have also become very astute in terms of choosing which kind of projects to do where, depending on the strength of the IP. So given that, you know, the patent itself, the strength of the law, the, the strength that the law itself provides is probably uh, becoming less important. Uh, the second thing that they do is that they also rely on a bunch of organizational mechanisms, right? HR, managing talent, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, involvement of, so this is a survey that we did across 140 multinationals uh, in India. And they spoke about a bunch of these organizational mechanisms, and some of those that were really important were, you know, the involvement of headquarters personnel. So there would be sort of two or three people who would have knowledge of what is actually going on in India sitting elsewhere, right, on a day-to-day -day basis. There would be calls, there would be conference calls, and so on and so forth, simply to ensure that, you know, it was just not the people in India that had the knowledge. It was sort of dispersed right through the organization. This is uh, arguably a very costly exercise, but companies believe in doing that. Uh, and the other thing which is sort of similar in spirit is building interdependence between locations. They'd say, okay, here is a project that's not just done in India, but there'll be a center from Cambridge, uh, the UK, and elsewhere, right? So you would sort of, and some component in Cambridge would depend on uh, a component from India and vice versa, right? So the, the reason for this is a single unit, right? India or China in this case, did not have a complete view of the entire project. They only had a tiny portion, and even if that leaked out, it wasn't that expensive. Um, lots of investment in uh, firm-specific assets, right? So they would build a lot of these software for check-in and checking out of software and so on and so forth. Access control was a big deal, and the idea is they would give you, give the uh, R&D employees a set of tools uh, without which they'll be completely unproductive. And these uh, tools were very specific to the firm, right? So in the case of Novartis, this used, uh, this used to be the uh, throughput scanning tools that was very, very specific to Novartis. Uh, so much so that if they leave and go elsewhere, the scientists would be half as productive, right? Um, so the influence of patents themselves is limited simply because, you know, the multinationals are learning how to manage these uh, scenarios. Uh, and it only matters for uh, a few types of projects. So now I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, India-specific uh, issues. So in terms of implementation, right, Jay had a question about implementation. Um, you know, these murmurs uh, continue, right? Uh, there is this uh, notion or allegation uh, by multinationals that especially the judges uh, exhibit some sort of economic nationalism to the detriment of multinationals, right? And uh, we went out and did that uh, analysis. We took all the litigations from 1895 till 19, uh, I'm sorry, till 2010, and we looked at uh, all the judgments. More or less, this is true, right? Um, this is true right across the board, not just for patents, but trademarks as well. Um, and uh, there is a significant, uh, you know, this section actually s continues to be problematic. Sections like these continue to be problematic. With uh, trade uh, trademarks, you know, the you know judges just don't uh, take into account uh, transbroader reputation, right? So, for example, in India, just to talk about trademarks, Hilton did not get a trademark in India for a long time, simply because. Uh, they said that a tiny hotel in Rajasthan known as Hilton uh, had more reputation than Hilton uh, in India. So that was true in India, but typically the judges take into account transporter reputation. Um, so this, these murmurs uh, are true and uh, they are detrimental to 
multinationals. But however, you know, here is one area wherein the multinationals have, you know, haven't learned, right? We spoke about how multinationals have learned to manage projects, but here is a reason, a, a region where multinationals haven't learned, which is like, you know, if you think about Novartis, most of them prefer the litigation route, right? Somehow the, there is this feeling in the government uh, that these guys, the multinationals are just there for the short term, fly-by-night operators. Uh, they are not there to make these large investments in employment and so on and so forth. Uh, and what I think, um, which came out from our conversations with, uh, with at least with Ranjit Sahani of uh, Novartis, the fact that uh, you know what uh, they could have done better is to engage the government, right? So, Novartis had a program by which they used to give away drugs free to to the poor people. Um, he thought that you know these non-market strategies could have been highlighted more rather than going through the litigation route. Right, so this is something, uh, so and our argument in this paper is that look, if somehow the multinationals got this right, you know, maybe the uh, judges may not be as uh, nationalistic as they are at the moment. Yeah, so. So in terms of domestic firms, there is a lot of, uh, I mean, there's some evidence that technology diffuses from the uh, Western multinationals to domestic firms. Um, and I should say that this is a project that was funded by IMS uh, last year. So what we found is that in markets wherein there's lots of foreign patenting, there's a lot of entry by Indian firms, the domestic firms as well. Um, but what ends up happening is although there is a lot of entry, uh, foreign firms tend to be very dominant, right? You know, yes, I'm seeding entry, but it doesn't mean that these uh, entrants are doing anything. Uh, they tend to be marginal entrants, uh, and this is true especially in pharmaceutical industries. Uh, fears of price increases, especially in sectors like pharmaceuticals, appear to be true. The prices are very high whenever there is a lot of foreign patenting in the market. Um, but you know what? It also turns out that the quantity consumed increases in these markets. So this is this idea that Indians like to uh, travel in uh, Mercedes or pick your favorite Car. Yeah. Um, so even though the prices are increasing, right, uh, the consumption is not going down, as is often being worried uh, or spoken by the politicians. So they like it, they are consuming it, despite the fact that the prices have increased. Uh, and the story of diffusion of knowledge is also true, but domestic firms are entering in large numbers, but it's not like uh, they are succeeding. Exactly. So it doesn't mean that consumption wouldn't have been a lot greater if the prices were lower. Just to say that consumption hasn't gone down in prices. Yeah, but in, in similar markets and similar times, you don't see the same thing, right? If it was an income effect, you would see this right across, right? So yes, there is some attributable effect. So because this is a different if, there's some attributable effect to income. No, I don't. I'm just saying that there's a shift of the demand curve. Right? In, the, in these markets, there's just a shift of the demand curves that increases prices in quantity. Uh, and that's what I'm talking about. Right? And if you think about patents as an exogenous shifter of demand, and this is uh, what is happening. And these demand curves offset the supply curve shifts as well. Right? And that's the idea. Um, and we, again, we went out and spoke to, this is the reason why we went out and spoke to the physicians. Right? You know, for a minute, I don't think I believe the result. We went out and spoke to the physicians because the uh, the pharmacists, the uh, you know the retail pharmacists claim that there is a lot of power in the hands of the physicians, and we went out and spoke to the physicians, and the physicians gave uh, at least in the large urban towns, which contribute to about 60 plus percent of the demand, they say that look we believe in prescribing Novartis's drug as opposed to Cyprus, right? Uh, and you know one could attribute a lot of reasons uh, underneath underlying that. But at least they believe that that is uh, what is true. Um, and there's also this other project, uh, ongoing project, which suggests that, at least in the internet industry, that might have spurred uh, domestic entrepreneurship. Um, you know, at least in the internet industry from 1994 till about 2015, 
most of the uh, employees seem to have come out of uh, these large multinationals, right? Um, I mean, again, this is ongoing projects. It's unclear what they are learning. We, a lot of them suggest that they're learning, uh, you know, these are typically programmers or coders, if you'd like, that come out from multinational firms. They seem to be learning, uh, if you go and talk to them, they said that what, what did this experience teach you? They said, look, business models, how to solve a problem efficiently, right? Um, so there's a company called Make My Trip, which is a travel website. Uh, you know, we spoke to one of the founders and said, what did you learn from a multinational that you didn't learn from an Indian firm? I said, look, the idea of how can I make my processes efficient and how can I cater to, a, you know, the audience that I'm, I'm targeting, right? So things that are attributable to business models. And this activity is more pronounced in uh, what are now emerging as uh, the internet clusters, right? Bangalore, uh, Delhi region, uh, and uh, Bombay. Um, you can't patent algorithms, but you can patent hardware devices. It's a little bit like European patenting, not the United States uh, business method patenting. Yeah, yeah. so in India it's the same thing, yeah. Uh, there are very few uh, patents, uh, software patents, or uh, the, uh, in India, yeah. So. I do, right, these, we have the complete population of patents, yeah, but very few of them are software patents. There's a lot of these uh, semiconductor hardware and so on and so forth. But still, so, there is a possibility It's possible, but it's not worthwhile. Right, so there is the story of uh, the encryption algorithm uh, that was done at Stanford, right? So US, prior to 1991, Dyer versus Rubber, 1991 had a similar patent law such as India at the moment. And uh, there's the story of the scientists uh, coming up with an algorithm, burning it in a chip and patenting that chip. Right, so, and they made no money out of it. So, um, so th we do find some um, evidence of spillovers that can be directly attributed to multinational firms. Um, uh, and so there's also this story, again, once again, this is uh, one f another project funded by IIMS. Uh, the data that we collected through uh, the project funded by IIMS is being used for this one as well. So the increased pressure in the domestic market seem to be driving away domestic firms away from their home turfs. There's a lot of entry, for example, in the US markets. So to give you a background, about 60% uh, of all drugs sold in the United States are generics, and about 80% of all generics are sold, uh, are manufactured uh, by Indian firms. So about roughly 50% of the total pharmaceutical market in the United States is uh, comprised of Indian manufactured, or I Indian firms supplying generics, right? So there's a lot more entry into the US markets, uh, but it, once again, it suggests that all kinds of inferior or marginal firms are trying to enter these markets, uh, lower success rates. Yeah. So sort of let me conclude. Um, yes, uh, at least on paper, India seems to be in integrated, right? If you believe one of the pushes towards the WTO trips was global integration, that seems to be true because there's a lot more, I mean, at least on paper, there's a lot more multinational activity despite the patent law. The domestic firms are also integrating more to the, uh, at least in the pharmaceutical in industry, to the U.S. markets. Um, the message, uh, or the, the message, the couched message by the politicians may not be true simply because, yes, prices have increased. There are other reasons as to why, I mean, like income, you know, and if you believe the pharmaceutical story, you know, there's some reason as to why these uh, foreign drugs, uh, you know, people want to consume them. Maybe physicians want their consumers to consume them. It's unclear, but there is uh, access may not be a big problem. Uh, and again, stronger patent regimes, uh, you know, there's this idea of diffusion of technology, which is uh, resulting in these domestic firms to enter. Uh, but in the domestic market, at least, the tables might be tilting in favor of multinationals, right? This was also feared 
but the consequences don't seem to be that big. Yes, there are price increases, but to the extent that they're also consuming them more, maybe it's not a big deal. Um, and of course, the question that everybody is asking in India is the fact that, look, how can domestic firms now compete, right? You know, sure, they are, you know, at, th at this point, they, they, are st they are entering, they're trying, but there's no evidence of success, and the tables have tilted in favor of multinational firms. Uh, and there are, of course, these varying answers. You know, some of them say that, look, we just have to find niches that multinationals cannot operate. These could be geographical uh, clusters. For example, there's the story that one of the pharmaceutical firms uh, gave us, which said that, look, why don't we actually compete in smaller towns? that the multinationals may not be willing to compete in small markets. The question is, is that large enough for you as a firm, as an Indian firm? Um, some of them say that, look, our thing is business models. We should just compete on uh, business models, come up with a way by which we can do something user, using our business model. Again, these are industry-specific answers. Maybe this is possible with, in a uh, sector like uh, telecommunications. Uh, and of course, the others are trying the risky route as well. Biocon, for example, they are saying that we will somehow introduce oral insulin to the US markets. Oral insulin doesn't exist uh, as of now. They are uh, going through their uh, problems in terms of uh, trials and so on and so forth. And a lot of the uh, commentators believe that they are risking an $800 million company to actually enter uh, the US markets through innovation. This is obviously a risky route. It's unclear how the dust, the dust is going to settle, right? We know, I mean, at least the, the limited uh, sense that I have is that the dust in the domestic market seem to have settled in favor of multinationals, yeah. And then I have some questions. Should we wait or, uh, uh, yeah. Um, so I do have some questions in terms of the, uh, how the report should be structured. Like you said, I mean, this wasn't a terribly coordinated presentation, you know. Uh, so, and some of these findings, and there are reasons for it, uh, besides the coordination issue, which is, uh, you know, which we will do better in the coming months. Um, some of these findings are industry specific, others pan across industries. So how do you, you know, I, I'm just looking for ideas about how the report should be structured. You know, can we have portions that are industry specific, uh, portions that are sort of industry agnostic. So what is the sense? Um, and, um, you know, again, this needs to be industry specific. So if there are parts that are very specific to certain industries, you know, is it okay to generalize uh, or not? What would be the extent of generalization? Um, so we could completely create uh, sort of industry specific reports as well, but then those, those are also limited in terms of appeal, right? Arguably. So, some thoughts around how to structure so these findings would be um, would be useful, yeah. Because uh, Nabahar is going to pr present something on the automobile industry, right? Well, there's so many findings. I mean, you can't do this as well. So, yeah. So, uh, and we can continue this, right? So, you could probably have this at the back of your mind as Nabahar is getting through his presentation, and we could come back and uh, revisit this later. Well, I think. I mean, my, my sense is that um, there might be one or two industries that would warrant a kind of separate mention, whether it's a separate report or not. But the pharma industry you talked about seems to be somewhat unique in India in terms of both innovation and the way in which innovation works. But the rest of the business, you know, feels like it's a little bit more together, and there might be some real power for kind of that discussion, and then maybe pull out something that says, you know, um, because it does feel like that piece of it is notably different from uh, its ability to patent and effectiveness and kind of the challenge of the MNCs, which is very different than some of the other, the other innovation. Um, that would be just my reaction. I, I actually concur with that. I, mean, I think there should be a, the collaborative report should be generalized yeah. and not pharma specific, just because. It's harder, I don't think that requires a pharmaceutical expert in you know, just a practical matter, but also I think in terms of the interest. So I actually, even in the presentation and you guys the conclusions, 
it wasn't clear to me which conclusions you felt were pharmaceutical specific and which were general. And part of that, of course, uh, you'll have to use your own instinct or analysis to try to understand which of these you think are. I mean, a lot of these issues about imitators not wanting protection, those are, that's general, right? But there are some weird things about the pharmaceutical market. I mean, the two that strike me is, uh, one, the way the market works is, is odd because the doctors kind of control things. So that's, that may really advantage foreign products in a way that is different than other products. Um, and other, the other thing, and I don't know if, to, to which this is true, it seems to me that pharmaceuticals to do really, to be really innovative requires a level of basic science kind of capability, which is really advanced. You know? So maybe it's an industry where that's why we see uh, even the really successful firms still really imitation focused. And I don't know if that's true. I'm wondering if one of the differences between China and India that explain this big difference in, in patenting at least, is the fact that China has such a developed industrial manufacturing sector where in some ways uh, there's more opportunities and demand to, by firms to, to patent as opposed to kind of the service sector where it's a few high level services but those types of areas are maybe are not. The, the, the domestic firms don't have the same kind of demand for patent protection or they're more innovators or something. You know, so I think that would be also interesting to try to understand. Okay. So but I think that you're such an expert on pharmaceuticals that if EY wants anything about the pharmaceuticals market um, in India, it seems like he could write up something really very, very useful. As a separate project. Okay. So, uh, uh, can, can I add something? Because from the Russian perspective, I guess it's very interesting to explore the pharma industry. Uh, because, well, we, we do have part of this uh, picture, we do have local genetic manufacturers. It goes broader than patenting because, for example, a few years ago we had a law that physicians cannot prescribe brands. They can only prescribe substances. And then it's up to the consumer to get uh, the brand for the sub substance. And, for example, if a hospital is uh, buying uh, medicine, if it's a hospital purchase, they have to make RFP for substance, and then companies bid uh, with different brands, but, but they bid for substance, not brands. And so it, it, it's it's trademark thing, but the reason is in Russia, state is very, very heavily involved in financing of healthcare, and it's more state financed than privately financed, and this is a big issue of cost, definitely, and of inclusivity of healthcare. And at the same time, Indian companies are big players in the Russian uh, pharmaceutical market. Red Box is, is very strong, and some others. And this gives probably a new perspective if we, if we do something about free markets. Uh, because Russia is definitely a market for India, and what happens in India in terms of innovation and capabilities, it affects the Russian market somehow. We, Probably doesn't work that way. I don't think it's sell the box to the Indian, but definitely from the Indian we get lots of uh, opportunities. So uh, I, I see certain reasons in, in somehow making a special thing about probably three countries, pharma and healthcare. Sure. Um, we could talk offline as well. So, uh, but uh, you know, that, that's sort of useful. And, uh, I don't know the, uh, the Russian perspective.